Welcome to the Daily Focus for July 21st. This is an extension of our teaching ministry at FBC. For more resources, um, find more videos like this on YouTube and join us on Sunday mornings as we devote more time to the study of God's Word. Romans chapter 14, all the way through Romans chapter 15, verse 13, um, talks of conflicts that don't come necessarily from sin, but from preferences. Would you read with me, starting in verse 1? As for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, well, the other person only eats vegetables. Let not only the one, uh, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and, and not the one who abstains pass judgment on, on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the, on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who abstains the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he, he gives thanks to God. Well, one who abstains, abstains in honor, of the, and the Lord gives thanks and of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. Let's stop there in verse seven. Focusing on the facts here, we've seen and you've seen what sin can do to a church. If you've been in a church at any time or if you've been around other believers, you see that at times when a believer falls into a sin or when church falls into a sin, it will destroy unity. It will damage the witness of that church and it will weaken the strength. And, and Christ gives directions on what to do when, when someone falls into, into sin, specifically in Matthew chapter 18, with the goal being to restore that person. And so in that, there's, there's something called church discipline, and it's vital to keep a body healthy. You can think of sin like cancer, and if it's detected early, the body will likely live and thrive. But too late, then the body will die. But beyond just sin, what's another serious problem that the church faces? In addition to sin, as Romans chapter 14, all the way through chapter 15 point out, it's not just sin that causes friction in a church, but it's, it's, it's the disagreements that come from what Paul defines as strong and weak believers. You see, believers come from all backgrounds, and you know this. In, in the church in Rome, believers were lumped into two different categories, Jews and Gentiles. Jews, those who had uh, a religious background that was really steep with traditions. And Gentiles, those, these people were pagan worshipers who were saved from the religion of, of the culture. And our church too, our church in Dimming specifically, is a melting pot of believers from a lot of different backgrounds. Some from a Roman Catholic background, some with no church background, some from a very strict Baptist background, some with no denomination uh, preference, no denominational preference, others from, from lives steep with sin, others coming from lives with a lot of morality. Lots of people have musical preferences. There are decoration preferences, budget preferences, even preferences on what songs we should sing on Easter. And even recently, we saw a lot of differences in how we respond to the pandemic and how we respond to the government and in, in seeing how it's treating the churches. There's preferences. And each of us, if redeemed by Jesus, are justified. And then the sanctification process where God takes us from who we are and breaks us and molds us to be more and more like Jesus. But even in that, you will live and you will die with preferences. And while they aren't sinful, hear me, the disagreements that come from them are, and they will lead to disunity. Haven't you seen this before? Ephesians chapter four, verse three, Paul said to the church, um, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and is the bond of peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says, And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said, And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 21, that um, the, the, the group of believers, especially the 11 disciples listening there, but all those that would come after Christ, come after them in, in belief in Christ, would be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, is what Jesus prayed, that they may be in us so that the world may see the purpose here, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
However, when, when a church is made with such diverse groups, then we see oftentimes that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of conflict there. Paul said, uh, Paul talked to the church, uh, the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and said, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 14, Paul says, and we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. First John chapter two, verse 13, tells us about infants, young men, fathers in the faith, and, and that all are on a continuum of spiritual growth and that we're to love each other as we should. And, we, and if we're to love each other as we should, then we need to understand what Paul's instruction here is in uh, Romans chapter 14, verse one, where Paul says, as for the one who is weak, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Here, as you read this on your own, and as you study on your own, when you have time, I want you to know, first of all, how Paul defines a strong and a weak believer. And that'll open up the passage for you. A strong believer would be defined as those who are liberated in Christ. Liberated brothers and sisters in Christ who understand fully what it means to be free in Christ. These are those that don't cling anymore to the meaningless traditions or forms of religion, even though they may have come from those. Strong believers understand fully that they are free from sin, free from death, free from hell, and free from Satan. They understand that they are not obligated to follow things as Paul writes in here, like holy days, ceremonies, or to have a strict religious diet. And they know that they're free to make choices dependent on how the Spirit of God moves in their hearts and free to make choices um, as as outlined in in, in the Word of God. Such people are strong in the faith. How would you define a weak believer? Well, in contrast, These are individuals that continue to hang on to rituals and ceremonies of the past, refusing to let go of them. They may have a strong culture of this. They don't believe that they have freedom in Christ to do otherwise. And and when freedom arises, it threatens them. So they prefer to remain as they are. And so what's the temptation of, of each type of believer? Well, the temptation of the strong believer, they're tempted to look down upon the weak as being people that are being legalistic or people without faith who get in the way of those who are trying to enjoy their liberty. They resent the weak for labeling their rightful freedoms in Christ as sin. And the weak, on the other hand, they tend to condemn the strong for what they see as an abuse of liberty. However, they're not in a position to judge since they don't understand what true Christian liberty is is. Know that in Christ, we're free. We're free. So those believers that are weak will not always be weak. They, they will begin to understand and hopefully be discipled to taught the uh, be disciple to know that, that in Christ, you're free from the penalty of sin. You're free from the power and dread of death. You're free from the punishment of hell. You're free from the grasp of Satan. Um, you're free. You're free from the, from, from the, the moral laws of the Old Testament. I'm sorry, you're, you're not free from those. You're not free from all things. So you're not free from the moral laws, the ceremonial laws you're free from, but not the moral laws of the Old Testament. And you're still connected to the Ten Commandments, but you're, you're, free, from, you're free from those parts of the Old Testament that, that would um, bind in, in you a, a tradition that Christ was only meant to fulfill uh, and fulfilled in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we don't look to the pattern anymore. We look to the perfection that is Christ and the external ceremonial laws and rituals are done away with now. So in Rome, what were they to do? What are they supposed to do in Rome? As for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not quarrel over opinion. What are they supposed to do? Paul says, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will get a, give an account of himself towards God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Four principles that Paul gives here. One is to receive one another with understanding, verses 1 through 12. Verses 13 through 23, Paul says, build up one another. Verses uh, in the next chapter, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, Paul says, please one another, just like Christ did. And lastly, in chapter 15, verses 8 through 13, Paul tells them, 
to rejoice with one another in God's plan. You remember that both Jews and Gentiles in this church were part of the plan of redemption of God and that Christ became a servant to the Jews to fulfill the scriptures and to confirm the promises of the Old Testament. And then the message of Christ in the Great Commission was to start with the Jewish territory and expand to the ends of the earth and to proclaim that Jesus saves sinners. So then what are we to do? Same thing. Same thing. Love those who are in Christ where they are. Receive them. Build them up. Please one another as Christ has and rejoice with one another in God's plan. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. Um, the diversity of salvation, Father, speaks to your power and, and the power of the gospel. That is your gospel, Father. It speaks to that. Where we don't all come to Christ, Father, from the same background, but you call men and women to you, Father, from a variety of, of backgrounds. And I pray, Father, that as a church, we may focus in on what your word says, not what tradition says, but those that are uh, that cling to tradition, Father, or, or cling to other things that they see as vital. May we gently love them and nudge them closer towards what your word says, Father, so that they can see that in Christ there's freedom. But God, as we do that, I pray that those believers that are strong would be patient and not judging. And those believers that are weak, Father, would trust trust in you, Father, and that you would give them good, strong disciples, Father, that would bring them along. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.